Welcome back uh, to another uh, message of hope from the Amonville Gospel Hall. I'm sure you're disappointed it's not Nathan uh, who's speaking this week, but God willing, he'll be back next week, so never fear. For those of you who know me, you'll know that I love history. It's full of excitement and intrigue, and it's got better writing than uh, many a blockbuster film. The Spartans are a culture that I find particularly interesting in history. Their culture had both bad things in it and good things. And one thing that was prized among Spartan men was to be efficient with their language. And that's something that I would like to uh, emulate. There is an example of this that I find particularly funny. It is a situation where Philip II of Macedon uh, was invading southern Greece. And he had received the submission from many of the other key city-states, like Sparta. He turned his attention to Sparta and asked menacingly whether he should come as a friend or as a foe. The reply was a single word, neither. Losing his patience, Philip sent another message. If once I enter into your territories, I will destroy ye all, never to rise again. Again, the Spartans responded with a single word, if. Sometimes we can get a great deal of meaning from just a very few words. And so today, I'd like to look at five words and see what we can learn from them. The five words are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23, where it says, but we preach Christ crucified. Count them. We, but we, preached Christ crucified. Five words, but we preached Christ crucified. But there's very little point in me just saying these five words over and over again if you don't understand what they really mean. So we're going to take a little bit of time and look at what these five words mean. So the first word we'd like to look at is Christ. So who or what is Christ? Christ is a Greek word that means anointed one. It was used in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that was known as the Septuagint to translate the Hebrew word Messiah. So whenever we see the word Christ, it's the equivalent of the word Messiah. The Jewish Bible, which is the first 39 books of the Christian Bible, continually refer to somebody who was promised to come. Somebody who was going to achieve certain things. There had been much debate, and there has been much debate, amongst Jewish scholars over the centuries about this Messiah figure. Why was there debate? Well, because it was said of him that he would rule over a free in Israel, and that his kingdom would never come to an end. But also that he would die. And these two things seem to be incompatible, don't they? To live forever as the king of Israel and to die. There were some uh, Jewish scholars who said that the two uh, things that were going to happen, it was was based on the spiritual state of Israel. So if Israel was doing good, then he would come as king and if, he, if Israel were doing badly, he would come to die on a spiritual level. There were others who suggested that there would be two messiahs, one who would come and die and one who would come and be king. What Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians is that he was preaching that Jesus was the promised messiah. Not that he would be two people. Not that he would pick between two responses to Israel's spiritual state, but rather that the Messiah, or Christ, would come and twice. He would have two comings. There would be one coming where he would come to die, and there would be one coming where he would come to rule. There were many other things prophesied about Christ. When he would be born, where he would be born, things that he would achieve, what tribe he would come to, one very important thing to note was the time 
that he would arrive. He had to arrive, this Christ, this promised Messiah, he had to arrive during the second temple period, which ended in 70 AD, when the Romans destroyed the second temple. Okay, so he had to arrive sometime between the first temple being destroyed and the second temple being destroyed, okay, in that second temple period, which is a relatively short period of time. So, we now know roughly what is meant when Paul said Christ. So, Paul was preaching that he knew who this long-awaited person was, but what about crucified? Paul preached him crucified. So, what is crucifixion? If we were to look into the historical record, we would see that crucifixion was invented by the Persians around 3 to 400 BC. The Romans seem to have perfected this practice to the point that the Jewish writers of the time would rarely even name crucifixion. They just wouldn't say it. Uh, they used other terms, uh, such as the extreme punishment. There were three ways in which you could be crucified. There could be an upright pole that someone was secured into the ground and the person was attached to that pole. Doctors tell us that if the victim's hands were attached to the top of the upright pole, to directly above their heads, it would take between 10 and 30 minutes for them to die, as it was impossible for them to breathe in that way. So basically, they suffocated. They would probably pass out relatively quickly and would therefore be probably the most merciful means of crucifixion. Okay, so if you'd been sentenced to crucifixion, this was the one that you wanted. The second of the, uh, and the third way of crucifixion required not just a, a vertical pole, but a horizontal one. The second way the victim's eyes would be tied to this horizontal pole. It was the longest way of crucifixion, as the person would simply wait until exposure, dehydration, or infection from the beatings that they uh, received, or the blood loss from the beatings that they received uh, pre-crucifixion. Okay, so it took a long period of time. The final most common way of crucifixion was to be nailed to the cross instead of being tied. The feet would be nailed to the upright at an angle that would allow the victim to raise himself but not fully extend the legs. The arms would be nailed into the horizontal beam. The weight of the body on the outstretched arms would hold the victim in the breathe-in position. Okay, so imagine you can breathe in, but then you can't breathe out. Unable to breathe, the victim would have to push up on his injured feet in order to breathe out. They'd have to continue to do this up-down motion, dragging their back against the wood, until they simply couldn't do it anymore. Until they were so physically exhausted that they could not breathe. And then the victim would suffocate. Studies have shown that the longer the arms are trapped in this outstretched position, the greater the pain they would have felt. People crucified in this way were unlikely to last more than 24 hours. This was possibly the most humiliating and painful way to die. And it was reserved, even by the Romans, for only the very worst criminals. So why would we preach that the long-awaited Messiah was killed in the most brutal fashion? The answer lies in the reason why he was killed. So why was he crucified? We spoke about messianic promises, one of which is found in the book of Isaiah, in the Jewish Bible. It describes him there as a suffering servant. Isaiah 53 and verses 5 and 6 said, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He died because of our iniquities and our transgressions, the wrong things that we have done. We have done wrong. God cannot let this wrongdoing go unpunished. And so the Messiah took the punishment that we deserved onto himself in order to remove that punishment from us. The Christ did not have to come. He chose to. Jesus chose to suffer the worst punishment that man has ever devised. Not to mention what he had to suffer in order to pay for the penalty of our sin. He chose to suffer because he loves us. So does that mean that we are all safe from the eternal consequences of our sin? There are some who would say yes. God will save us. He'll save us all. But if that were true, then we would have to answer this question. Why preach? Remember our five words? We preach Christ crucified. Why preach at all? Paul said that he preached Christ crucified. If we were all to be saved, then why bother preaching at all? The reason Paul and the early church and the early Christians preached was because there was a choice to be made. We must choose Christ. We must willfully enter into his protection. It does not come by default. If you were to buy a new phone or or car or computer, you would find that it has default settings. Everyone who gets their new phone will have the same screensaver, the same apps, the same ringtone if you're buying the same model of phone. You have to choose to change your ringtone. Okay, so you get a ringtone, a standard, you have to choose, you have to make an active choice to change that ringtone. We all start as humans with the default setting of being under punishment for our sins. We have to choose the way we will deal with our sins. We can take advantage of the offer that has been made by Christ, or we can choose to try some other way. And that, asks, and, uh, and that answers the question why there was a but in the five words. But we preach Christ crucified. The but is there to signify that it is different from other worldviews. That of the Jews and that of the Greeks or Gentiles. There are some in this world who would suggest that all religious positions are pretty much the same. And it doesn't matter which you choose. The example given is that heaven is the top of a mountain. And you may be climbing up a different path from me, but we'll all reach the top if we just keep going. This is, of course, nonsense. Ask any mountaineering specialist. Not every path leads to the top of the mountain. Those who suggest that all religions are fundamentally the same are only showing their own ignorance of the religions that they are comparing. Worldviews, which is probably a more useful term uh, than religion, as it includes those who say they have no religion. Worldviews are superficially the same, perhaps, but are fundamentally different. They cannot all be true. Jesus, who Paul and the early Christians pointed to as the Messiah, he or Christ, was either the Messiah or he was not. Jesus said he was the only way to God. So he was either being blasphemous and worthy of the death sentence or he was right. He cannot be both. There were some Jews who said he was blasphemous and there were some who accepted him as the Messiah. They cannot both be right. 
They could both be wrong, but they cannot both be right. Jesus either was the Messiah or he was not. Jesus has either paid the price for sin or he has not. You have to make a choice. You can choose to accept his offer or choose to reject it. There is no middle ground here. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll be back, God willing, next week at the same time. Uh, Remember to like, comment and share this video with people that you think might be interested. Until next week.